This is the case of a 36 year old male who had a fracture in the base of the 4th and the 5th metacarpal bones. This was treated with percutaneous pinning using K wires. Four months later, the patient presented with first dorsal interosseous muscle wasting, loss of abduction and adduction of the ulnar three fingers, and weak thumb to index pinching. However, the patient had intact two point discrimination along the ulnar side of the hand and no hypothenar muscle wasting. So the problem list is a 36 year old male with 4th and 5th metacarpal bone fracture. Fracture was treated with percutaneous spinning using K wires. Four months later, the patient had first dorsal and erosseous muscle wasting, loss of abduction and adduction of the ulnar three fingers, and weak thumb to index pinching. Patient had intact two point discrimination along the ulnar side of the hand. Patient had no hypothenar muscle wasting. How would you face the case? Neuroma excision and nerve grafting or nerve transfer? The votes are in and you chose A. The authors report a fascinating case of ulnar motor brain neuropathy after pinning of displaced 4th and 5th metacarpal base fractures. Question is, how to treat this? Grafting or nerve transfer? Jamie Patelli described a difficult but seemingly successful nerve transfer of the motor branch of the opponent's pollicis to the deep terminal division of the ulnar nerve. This terminal division innervates the adductor pollicis and the first dorsal interosseous muscle. He recently followed up on this description with an anatomic study that shows one can use the base of the third metacarpal as a landmark to localize this deep terminal division. To my knowledge, this is the only nerve transfer, this distal, that might provide any benefit to the patient discussed in this case. However, this nerve transfer only reconstructs pinch, not function, of the other interosseous muscles. And the patient in this case had loss of abduction and adduction of the ulnar three fingers. We also have to keep in mind that this transfer has only been reported in three people. Since the patient is young, 36 years of age, I would explore and if possible repair the nerve with a graft. If the zone of injury was too large for a graft, which seems unlikely, or the nerve graft would bypass the interosseous muscles anyway, I would consider instead performing the nerve transfer. The nerve transfer does carry the theoretical benefit of earlier and more reliable recovery. I also want to mention the use of time-tested tendon transfers. If there's no recovery after sufficient time, and I generally try to wait the full two years, one can consider pinch reconstruction. Either ECRB or BR can be extended with a tendon graft, passed through the second or third web space from dorsal to volar, and attached to the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb to restore a Dr. Paul's function. There are a couple of noteworthy aspects to this case. First, the anterior-posterior direction of one of the pins is concerning. The way I think about these injuries is that you do not need to capture the fractures with a pin. Instead, I generally aim for a spanning construct, placing my pins in the frontal plane, erring on the dorsal side of the hand. This likely reduces the chance of inadvertent nerve injury. Secondly, the authors report recovery of pinch at three months, which seems somewhat early, but I'm glad to hear the patient is doing well. This highlights another notable consideration in peripheral nerve studies. The commonly used MRC scales are somewhat subjective. Perhaps the patient pinch strength improved because their FPL strength increased. Ideally, we would use reproducible objective measures such as re innervation of the adductor pollicis measured on EMG. However, in practice, it's difficult to obtain such repeated studies. I would like to thank the authors for highlighting this devastating complication of pinning and for demonstrating an excellent potential treatment.